Good morning, University Church of Christ family. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We are certainly thankful to God for his amazing grace and that he's allowed our lives to roll on a little while longer. We thank those of you who are members of the University Church of Christ who are on Facebook as well as on the teleconference. Thankful to those who are members of other congregations of the Churches of Christ who may be watching on Facebook. And of course, we're always thankful for our friends, family, co-workers, and associates who join us who may not yet have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they might learn more about God's holy and divine will. Before we begin our worship assembly on this Sunday, July 26, virtually, I just want to remind everyone to continue to keep our, our loved ones in, in prayer who are members of the congregation. We want to continue to remember Sister Von Seal Hill, Sister Sincere Ray Stewart, Sister Cherie Warner, Sister Louise Hewling, always Sister Emma Brown, and Brother Albert Wood, Jr. Uh, we also want to remember Sister Cornelia Swing and Brother Melvin Flowers, Sister Julia Hicks, as well as Sister Patric Patricia Gaines. Uh, I want to announce, for those of you who may not be aware of it, uh, Sister Linda McLean was rushed to uh, emergency from her hairdresser on yesterday morning. Uh, by the time I got to the hairdresser, the hairdresser had called to 911 and she had been rushed via ambulance to Hillcrest Hospital. Uh, she has been admitted there and we are going to ask that you would certainly uh, lift uh, Linda in prayer and ask that God would continue to guide and direct. She has a new doctor. Uh, hopefully this new doctor can figure out what is going on with her. Uh, she may be trying to watch it in the hospital room. May she know that our thoughts and our prayers and our love uh, are out to her. Some good news on the horizon. Uh, Brother Cottingham, Brother Robert Cottingham celebrated a birthday on this past Friday. And we say a belated happy birthday, but we thank God for his gift. Uh, to his family, to his wife, Sister Christine, their children, to the rest of their family. And of course, he's a gift to us at the University Church of Christ. So Brother Robert, we say happy birthday and may God continue to bless and keep you in his loving care. It's also my understanding that uh, Brother Washington, as well as Sister Kenyatta Wesley, have birthdays on today. And so we say to the both of you, happy birthday. And our prayer is that God will continue to bless you. Uh, we thank you, thank him for giving you to your respective families, as well as uh, the University Church of Christ. I want to remind everyone that e-giving is now operational. You can give via our website online. Uh, there's a button that you can push there, and you can give either by check, which is an ACH transaction, or debit or credit card. Uh, instructions for how to use it are also up on our website. Those of you who have email addresses uh, that we have access to, we have sent you uh, some videos with links to, to watch those as well. And we will be sending out hard copies to the rest of the congregation on this coming week. But we want to thank you again for all that you have done in giving us uh, or giving to the Lord even though we have not been assembling at the church building. We did not meet at the building last week. We're not meeting there today. And uh, we're going to uh, be foregoing meeting together for the foreseeable future. Uh, as I announced on last Lord's Day and via the robocall on Saturday, uh, we had two of our, our wonderful members who unfortunately were tested positive uh, for COVID-19 virus and so we had to shut down the, uh, the church building until such time that it can be cleansed and sanitized. And we're watching uh, what stage COVID-19 is. Uh, I believe right now it's in the yellow stage and we're keeping very close eye on what that's going to mean. If it's elevated to an even uh, more intense level, we will let you know. But for the time being, we're not going to be meeting at the church. The elders and I uh, have talked about it, and we want to make sure everyone is kept safe. Uh, those two individuals, uh, I did not announce it on last Lord's Day because I did not have permission from them. 
uh, and I was certainly mindful of not violating HIPAA, uh, but uh, Brother Donald Nelson and Sister Annie Nelson and Brother Nelson has uh, asked me to uh, announce their names, that we would lift them in prayer, and uh, they should be near the end of their quarantine period, uh, but one of our elders and his wife uh, tested positive, and uh, we were not uh, free to announce that until we got permission uh, from the family because health information is protected information. So continue to pray for them, all of those uh, who are dealing with health concerns, continue to pray for those who are administering to them, uh, doctors and nurses and medical staff, uh, to the family members who are administering to those families. Your prayers are greatly appreciated. And again, because of what happened on last weekend, uh, I just wanna encourage all of you. Uh, it's very important that we be able to reach you. So please make sure uh, that we have your updated contact information uh, including your email, your mailing address, and phone numbers, especially when you change them that you might get the robocalls. And I want to say a very special thank you to uh, Brother Rick Winston. Uh, he is just such a, a, a vital member of the University Church of Christ. And on last Lord's Day, when I was not able to get through on the teleconference call, uh, he took the initiative uh, to where he finally got through on the other telephone number, the previous one that we were using, and so those of you who were able to get on the teleconference were able to get on as he hooked you in and put the phone up to the computer for the Facebook live presentation. Uh, Brother Winston, thank you so very, very much for all that you do, uh, for your heart for God, your heart for the University Church family, and your support of our ministry. Right now we're going to go into our call for worship. We are now about to worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, to the woman from Samaria, that the time was coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of spirit washed in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Pray with me. O wise and all merciful Father who art in heaven, holy and reverend is your name. We humbly bow before you on this morning, thanking you for your grace and your mercy. You've allowed our lives to roll on a little while longer, and for this we say thank you. Father, you've heard of the names that have been called who are on our sick and shut-in list. Would you be with each and every one of them and those who are ministering to their medical needs? Use them as instruments in your hand for uh, their total healing and recovery. Father, we thank you for those who celebrated uh, birthdays, Brother Cottingham, on Friday, Brother Washington and Sister Kenyatta on today, uh, we thank you for those days that we can celebrate for. We realize that it's in you that we move and live and have every being. Bless and strengthen and keep them in your loving care. 
thank you now for the opportunity to have a virtual worship. And Father, my prayer is that all that we say and all that we do will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It's our desire to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise, to lift up Jesus that all might be drawn to him, that the saints of God will be edified, whether members of the University Church of Christ or the body of Christ throughout this great brotherhood of ours, and that those who may be watching or listening who have not yet obeyed the gospel, that somehow you will take the word that is proclaimed, convict them of the need of the salvation that's in Christ and in him alone, and that they will respond in humble obedience and obey from the heart the doctrine of Christ. Thank you for giving Jesus your son. He died on the cross for our sins. You raised him for our justification. He's on your right hand right now making a decision for us. Father, forgive us of our sins. May we hear your voice. Speak your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 186 in our songbook from the Congregation Songs of the Church. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. 186. Join in and sing with me, if you will. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song shall and the reading of scripture, hymn number 40 and the songs of faith. We all know it, even if you don't have a song book, mansion, robe, and crown. Mansion, robe, and crown. Let us all together sing. 
I'm going to trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. I'll join him in that land where till no sorrows can be found. When I receive my mansion, robe and crown, mansion, robe and a crown. Bed him always abound. Let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion, robe and crown. The weather there is always fair. There's sunshine day and night. No cold, no, no rain will fall there, for the sun shines ever bright. I'll need no heavy garment, I'll just wrap my robe around. When I receive my mansion, robe and crown, mansion, robe and a crown, Wrong surround, Lord, please reserve my mansion, robe and crown. My head is bowed and bloody now from the work that I've tried to do. But one day I'll be rewarded with a crown so bright and new. I'll wear a smile so bright, for there'll be no cause for a frown. When I receive my mansion, robe and crown, mansion, robe and a crown, their love always abound. Let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion, robe and crown. Amen. Lord, please reserve my mansion, robe and crown. The meditation on this morning comes from the 121st Psalm. Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8. That's Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. That's our meditation scripture for this morning. The scripture for the sermon, the text, is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Romans Chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. I want to give you a little time to get there. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. There the word of God says, Therefore being justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. May the Lord add a blessing to the reader, to the hearers, and to the doers of his holy and divine word. Before we go into prayer, one verse of sweet hour of prayer, it's hymn number 485 in the Songs of the Church. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, let cause me from a world of care and bid me my father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has found relief and all escape the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer pray with me gracious father it is indeed a sweet hour of prayer. In these troublesome times that we are living in, with the continued outbreak of the coronavirus, those who have been touched by it and have lost loved ones, or they have had it, and some have been killed, and yet there is such pain and agony for all there is trepidation when we are told that we test positive, not knowing what the end is going to be. In the midst of the social unrest, lives that are being lost because of injustice, and even because Satan is using legitimate concerns to spur some people to become ungodly in their behavior. And so the real message is being lost. As we look into our world where supposedly we're a country full of religion, full of churches, yet with all of the religion, we still seem so very far from you. Father, help us to Clarify the truth of your word this morning. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. May I stand in the power and the energy of your spirit and not in the power of the flesh. Use me as your mouthpiece. Speak to all of us. Those who are your children, encourage us, build us up. And to those who are not your children, who don't know where to turn in the midst of the chaos of our world. Please use my voice, my tongue, these words to convict them of the need of the salvation that's in Jesus and in him alone. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Before I listen, hymn number 249, again a familiar hymn that most of us know, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. We'll just sing the first and the third stanza. Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth and move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold to God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold to His hand. To God's unchanging hand. You ought to build your hopes on things eternal. Well now, Hold to God's unchanging hand When your journey is completed If to God you have been true Fair and bright the home and glory Your enraptured soul Hold on to my God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold to his hand. To God's unchanging hand. You ought to build your hopes on things eternal. Well now hold to God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold to it. Hold on to my God's unchanging. Everybody ought to hold to his hand to God's unchanging hand. You ought to build your hopes on things eternal. Well now, hold to God's unchanging hand. Amen. Hold to God's unchanging hand. As I was preparing for today's worship, what to say to you to, to encourage you, what to say to those who are not members of the body of Christ, to cause them to think about the fact that we need God or they need God more than God needs, needs them. And as I find myself in the circumstances with Sister McLean being rushed to the hospital again, I thought about a sermon that I have become very fond of. And it's from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Weakened by circumstances, strengthened by, by faith. I've already read into your hearing Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, but I want to read it again for, for emphasis' sake. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given un, unto us. 
as this pandemic has continued on, as everything seems to be up in flux, as as the shepherds and the deacons and I, along with key brethren who help us with technology, try to figure out ways that we can keep you encouraged and strengthened, we are well aware that circumstances are trying our, our souls. Burdens, though they are uninvited, have shown up in all of our lives. These uninvited burdens can be complex, as Psalm 102 indicates. Psalm 102 demonstrates that we can suffer physically, we can suffer emotionally, we can suffer mentally, we can suffer socially, and we can suffer spiritually, and sometimes all at the same time. Life-altering burdens are not one-dimensional. The story is told of two men in Matthew chapter 7 that build their houses. You know it well. Jesus told this story, one built on sand and the other one built on a solid foundation. When the storm came, the first house collapsed and the second withstood the onslaught of the storm. When Jesus spoke this parable, he was talking about people's differing responses to his message he described the individual who listens to him and does what he says as a person who builds on a rock. The one who does not hear and obey Christ is described as foolish. What the builders had in common was that storms came upon both of them. And like them, if we were able to live a perfect life and avoid self-inflicted problems, storms would still come. We don't live in a perfect world and since the Garden of Eden sin has infected the human race and the consequence of this is death and death is universal according to Romans 5 and verse 12. There is no way that all hurtful experiences can be avoided. We will face tragedies. We will lose jobs. We will lose friends. We will lose loved ones. In essence, we must learn how to preserve or persevere even in losing seasons. The writer speaks of pressure and describes these times in Romans chapter 5 verse 3 as, quote, tribulations, unquote, or another word for you and I would be sufferings. The word is translated from the Greek word philipsis. It means trouble. It means oppression and hardship. The Apostle Paul uses the term in the plural because problems are numerous and various. Problems are here to stay. They can weigh on us. They can pressure us like water pressing against a levee. We can be weakened, but even in being weakened momentarily, we do not give in to the tide of trouble that goes in and out, beating on the levees of our faith. We are not only seeing more natural storms in the here and now in terms of nature. We're seeing more storms of a meek, weakened morality in our country. Financial tsunamis and tidal waves of senseless violence are beating against the levees of our faith. Surprisingly, the writer declares that saved people rejoice even in their tribulations. Why is that? Is it because that people who are saved are insane? No, it's not because we are insane, but the reason is because saved people are influenced, infused, and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual insight helps them see their suffering in a different light. Pressure fosters patience. Patience produces character. Christian character yields substance to the hope of heaven. In other words, if the pressures of life are used properly for spiritual development, they can be appreciated because the result is the greater desire to leave this old world and to be at home with God in heaven. Not only are we pressured, but many times in our pressure, we're often perplexed. Pressure can be so intense 
That many times it's hard to see the benefit. In fact, pressure sometimes causes us to compromise our faith instead of building it up. It is only through pressure that we really know what we're made of. James put it this way in James chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy. My beloved brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, James said, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The New American Standard Bible reads of James 1, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You may be thinking about now, Brother McClain, that, that sounds good, but, but we live in the real world. I know, I know you live in the real world. Guess what? I also live in the world, real world. And the real world, yes, has some challenges for each and every one of us. Even on July 26, 2020. But Jesus also lives in this world. But he left us an escape route out of this world. And he said in John chapter 10, verse number 10, that the thief being the devil cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Satan has a strategy and it can be understood in one word and that word is deception. He is the master deceiver. He is the camouflage king and the reason that he has turned to deception is that he knows that he does not have the power to overcome God. He tried that when he was an angel of light in heaven and he attempted to overthrow God. The gamble failed and he got kicked to the proverbial curb. Lucifer, that fallen angel, knows that God can do something that he cannot do. And that is to create something out of nothing by simply speaking something into existence. God looked at nothing. And in Genesis 1 verse 3 it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 16, God looked into the midnight sky and made his own light show with the stars. God took the barren land and decorated it with streams, rivers, flowers, and trees. God scooped out the valleys and dotted the blue canopy of heaven with the cascading mountain. You can't tell me what God can't do. Satan can't create anything. All he can do is manipulate and maneuver that which has already been created. That's why Satan is messing with you. Satan has to maximize the little power that he has, and deception is what he's good at. Are you on the line today? He always wants to be starting something. He's a mess maker, but can't do anything creative. His deception, though, is noteworthy because he's turned that into an art form. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, the New American Standard Bible, the Apostle Paul wrote, But I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You see, Satan wants you to turn left when you should be turning right. He wants to make you miserable when you should be happy. He wants you to taste defeat when you should be enjoying victory. He's a counterfeiter, and the better the counterfeit, the fewer number of people that are realizing that they are carrying fool's gold. The devil today has a theme song, and it's entitled, I Gotta Be Me. He wants you to take on this theme song for yourself that I did in my way. He wants you to believe that you don't have to answer to God who is trying to guide you in the ways of righteousness. But I got up this morning to tell you that this universe is God's house. And God is just letting us live in a borrowed room. There's a big difference between the owner of the house and the guest in the house. 
Psalm 24 verse 1 declares the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. You cannot successfully move against God's program and you cannot move against God's program and expect to receive all of God's blessings. The devil has several purposes. First of all, he wants to prevent salvation. He doesn't want unsaved people to be saved. He wants to keep them right where they are. And he will even use religion to keep them right where they are. He blinds their minds and confuses them in order to keep them from finding the truth which is in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God with a little g of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. First, he wants to prevent salvation. Secondly, he wants to make Christians ineffective. He wants to interrupt the process by which God gets the glory through you. He wants to render you ineffective in terms of your real impact for Jesus. He will keep stuff stirred up in your life to depress you, to discourage you, and have you living underneath your circumstances instead of you getting on top of your circumstances. He will distract you with debt, burden you with bills and the cares of the world in order to keep you focused on a failing economy to choke out your witness or cause you to be too unhappy to witness effectively for the Lord. If he can keep you down, if he can keep you distracted, if he can keep you burdened, he knows that you won't do anything much worthwhile for the Lord. God won't get the glory from you if you're too miserable in your attempt to handle your own problems. Satan will twist your mind and have you thinking that evil is good and good is evil. Thirdly, he wants to frustrate God's will. Satan tried to frustrate the accomplishment of God's will even in Jesus' life. God's will for his son Jesus was the cross. But in the wilderness in Matthew 4, the devil tried to get Jesus to take another way. He even used one of Jesus' own disciples against him in an effort to turn him away from the cross. Only the devil could have thought of an attack this bold. And Jesus knew who was behind it. So we read in Matthew 16, verse 21 through 23, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he, being Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things of of God, but those that be of men. Basically, he was telling Satan that his role was not to influence him. Now, if the devil wasn't afraid to turn Jesus away from the cross, what do you think that he has planned for you and I? What do you think his strategy is for your life and for my life? The devil is going to be on our trail from the cradle to the grave. And though the storms are raging high, we can keep singing, Hide me in the blood of Jesus until the danger passes me by. Circumstances try us, they concern us. And yes, they can take something out of us. We can become weakened by circumstances, but that ought to drive us to Jesus, knowing that Jesus will make a way somehow. First of all, we need to understand that Christ suffered for us in the flesh. 1 Peter 4, verse 1. He sympathized with the grief of others. John chapter 11, verse number 35. He is touched by our infirmities and our circumstances. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. So I urge us to always focus on the will of God. 
Yes, you may be going through something right now, but if you're going through it, you might as well get something out of it. If you've got to go through something, you might as well learn a lesson from it. If we've got to go through some things, we might as well learn what it is that God wants us to learn from the stuff that we're going through. It would be a shame for us to go through all of this stuff in life and not learn anything. We need to always ask, what does God want me to learn from this? A very succinct answer is that he wants to make us stronger. Secondly, in learning, he wants us to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, the second half of that verse, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Arm yourselves is a command that suggests personal responsibility. We have the capability to get a hold on our perspective. When the earth crumbles around us, that may be the only time that there is one thing that you can control, and that is your perspective. It's the way that you look at it. You can control the way that you look at your circumstances. Someone has asked, who fits the following description? A man in a mask takes out a knife and cuts you open, takes your money, and leaves you unconscious. Some would say, that's a robber. Others would say, that's a surgeon. I suppose it depends on your perspective. I often think about Paul's thorn in the flesh. This thorn in the flesh must have been more than an aggravation. As great as Paul was and as spiritual as he was, he asked God to remove it. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 and 8, this is how he records it. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. As great and dedicated as the Apostle Paul was, he asked the Lord to remove this thorn. Are you there today? Sometimes we reach that point when we say, I can't take it anymore. I know I'm supposed to be patient. I know that the Lord will make a way. I know the word of God. I know that I'm supposed to bear my cross. I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I know all of that. I can quote the scriptures, but every now and then all of us have something that comes across our path that has a saying, Lord, I can't take it anymore. But you see, the Lord never leaves us with the, the ability to handle it. Circumstances may persist, but his grace is always sufficient. In other words, his grace is enough. It will take care of us. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul records, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul was strengthened by that, and he came to himself, and he said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, God might not take it away, but he'll give you something to empower you to handle it. God, redirect your mind to a higher plane. The idea is that circumstances arise many times wherein good is not always conceivable. But God promises those that love him that spiritual benefits are born out of circumstances. If we desire to be wise builders of a life that can withstand the storms beating against the levees of our faith, we ought never to renounce faith and never give up the hope of heaven. Circumstances may weaken you, but God's strength is available. His grace is always sufficient. God will not only bring you through the storm, but I believe that God can speak a word to you while you are in the storm. 
Do you remember Job? There were all kinds of problems in his life. In the 16th chapter, he had already lost his children. He had already lost his wealth and his health. In addition to this, he was humiliated and falsely accused. He had been weakened by personal storms. But Job says in Job 16, verse 7 and 8, But now he hath made me weary. Thou hast made desolate all my company, and thou hast filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me, and my leanness rising up in me beareth witness to my face. In verse 11 and 12, he continues, God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. In the midst of his storm, Job had a pity party. God must have had enough of Job's complaining because in Job 38, Verse number one says, God answered Job out of the whirlwind. God can and has spoken to his people while they were in the midst of the storm. God said to Job in Job 38, 4, tell me if you have understanding. Again in verse 4 of chapter 38, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? In Job 38, 5, who set its measurements since you know? In Job 38, 12, have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place? In Job 38, 16, have you entered into the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? In Job 38, 28, has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? In Job 38, 29, from whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven? Who has given it birth? You see, when you're in a storm, you need to always consider the storm maker. God has always been there and God is here now. I tell you what, after Job heard God, he got an attitude adjustment. It changed his perspective, and after God finished talking to him, in Job 42.1, Job stopped complaining, and he started praising. He says, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be, be withholden from thee. Even God's son had to suffer and learn that complete submission to the Father's will leads to spiritual results in glory. Like this, we are promised that if we obey Jesus, he will be the source of our salvation. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Think of the circumstances of Christ as he con contemplates his sacrifice for people like us with sweat like great drops of blood. He thinks about what is before him. He deliberates of his fate and thinks about his circumstances, yet without faltering, without failing, without quitting, without compromise, without delay, and without hesitation. Jesus did what had to be done. At Calvary, he revealed the awfulness of sin. He carried the burden of sin. He crushed the defense of sin, displayed the horror of sin, and exposed the evils of sin, and he received its wages, which is death. I say to you today, He's a wonderful Savior to me. Without Him, life would be uncontrollable. Forgiveness would be unattainable. Hope would be unthinkable. The past would be unbearable. The present would be unlivable. And the future would be unfaceable. Rise above your circumstances because you are God's child and God cares for you. When you're down, just get up. When you're weakened, just get up. When you're hurting, just get up. Circumstances and sin will bring you down. When life delivers another, another love, TKO, and you're thinking of letting the Lord go, by repenting of your sin, the Lord will pull over and pick you up. Then you can tell the world that you know the Lord. Look 
at yourself and look in the mirror and know that you belong to God and that God will lift you up. There have been so many things that have held us down. And even in the midst of this pandemic, there are, are some who are, are losing their hope, losing their faith, wondering what's going to happen. And look around and finally I want you to understand that one day God is going to turn everything around. I know we've got a long way to go. I know where life takes us. I don't know what that's going to be. But we're not letting anything hold us back. We're pulling ourselves together. We're polishing up our Christian life. If you've ever been held down before, I know that you refuse to be held down now. Christians, listen, don't let nothing stand in your way but because we're listening to every word that the Lord has to say. I want to say to you, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will die and go down into the Hadean world. But don't worry about it. I'm coming back from the dead with all power in heaven and in earth. Nothing can stop the church of our Lord. We're God's people and we're on the move. Aren't you glad that you're in Jesus Christ? Aren't you glad that you're a member of the body of Christ? Aren't you glad that he is a wonderful Savior? God is amazing, isn't he? He can do what no one else can do. God is like all my cards. He cares enough to send the very best. God is like Scotch tape. You can't see him, but you know he's there. God is like all state. You're always in good hands with the Lord. God is like dial soap. Aren't you glad you know him? Don't you wish everybody did? God is like the U.S. Postal Service. Neither rain nor snow nor sleet nor ice will keep him from his appointed destination. God is like bounty. He's the quicker picker-upper and can handle the tough jobs and he won't fall apart on you. God is like Maxwell House. He's good to the last drop. I want to say to those of you who are not Christians, who are not members of the body of Christ, the church of Christ, the church of our Lord, that he promised to build in Matthew 16, the church that began in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came, the church that began when Peter preached about the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day according to the scriptures. I want you to know that that gospel is still powerful today. Paul had written earlier in Romans chapter 1 verse number 14 that I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I, I'm now ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Why? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is what is the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel of Christ. The facts are contained in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, succinctly the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on the third day according to the scriptures, his ascension into heaven, his being on the right hand of God and one day coming back again. You have to believe that he died for your sins and that you cannot save yourself. John 8, 24 when you believe that, you have to be willing to repent of your sin, change your mind, change your will, change your actions. Luke 13, 3 and 5 at 17 and 30. Then you must confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's son. Romans 10, verses 9 and 2. Matthew 10, verse number 32. And then be buried, baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. Acts 2, verse number 38. Romans 6, verse 3, 4 and then verse 17. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 and 1 Peter 3, verse number 21. When that happens, he adds you to his army. He adds you to his family. He adds you to the bride of the church. I, I'm reading a book. I'm reading a book right now called The Forgotten and, it, and it's about how African Americans were treated 
in the army in the Second World War and how they were not respected and how Jim Crow even went over there and they were wondering how in the world can we be fighting for freedom of a country that won't allow us to be free. Well, I stop by to remind you that Jesus will make you free. For if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. So as I close this message, I want you to know I'm a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Bible is my code of conduct, faith, prayer, and the word are my weapons of warfare. I've been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I am a volunteer in this army, and I'm enlisted for eternity. I will either retire in this army at the coming of Jesus or die in this army, but I will not get out, sell out, be talked out, or pushed out. I am faithful, reliable, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. If he needs me in the Sunday school to teach the children, work with the youth, help adults, or just sit and learn, he can use me because I am there. I am a soldier. I am not a baby. I do not need to be pampered, petted, primed, pumped up, picked up, or pepped up. I am a soldier. No one has to call me, remind me, write me, visit me, entice me, or learn me. I am a soldier. I am not a wimp. I am in place saluting my king, obeying his orders, praising his name, and building his kingdom. No one has to send me flowers, gifts, food, cards, candy. Or give me handouts. I do not need to be cuddled, cradled, cared for, or catered to. I am committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to cause me to quit. When Jesus called me into this army, I had nothing. Hello? And if I end up with nothing, I still come out ahead. I will win. My God has and will continue to supply all of my need. I am more than a conqueror. I will always triumph. I can do all things through Christ. Devils cannot defeat me. People cannot disillusion me. Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governments cannot silence me. And hell cannot handle me. I'm a soldier. And even death cannot destroy me, for when my commander calls me from this battlefield, he will promote me to captain and then allow me to rule with him. I'm a soldier in the army, and I'm marching claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. I am a soldier marching heaven bound. Here I stand today, and I want to know, will you stand with me? Guess what? If you obey Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, been baptized for the remission of your sins, you've already enlisted. The question is, which part of the service are you in? Are you on active duty, serving the Lord faithfully, daily, and on duty 24-7? Or are you on reserve status, serving only when called upon twice a year? Christmas and Easter, maybe even Mother's Day. Are you on guard guard status, backing up the active duty group? Or are you AWOL, absent without the Lord? That's my message to you today. My prayer, my prayer is that this message has encouraged your soul. I know it's encouraged mine just to be able to share it with you today. Remember this, God is more than able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Those of you who are not Christians, you've heard truth. Call the number, area code 216-421-0233, and thanks to Brother Rick Winston, even if you call the church number, he has it forwarded to his cell phone so we can get your message, and we'll help you obey the gospel of Christ. Or he send us a message on our website. And for those of you who are members of the Lord's Church and you just need prayer, call in on the conference call before we finish service. Or put your prayer request up on the website, up on Facebook Live, and 
will be glad to lift you in prayer. Sing with me, if you will, just a verse of just as I am. Without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou be now and move into the Lord's Supper. Matthew chapter 26, verse says 26 through 29. The text I want to use this morning. Acts 20 and verse 7 says, Upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread, and then they continued their speech until, until midnight. Where Paul continued his speech until midnight. They came together to take the Lord's Supper. Jesus in Matthew 26 instituted that Lord, Lord's Supper. It says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Pray with me, if you will. Gracious Father, as we partake of the Lord's Supper in obedience to your word, Father, help us to be mindful of the suffering of Jesus on the cross for our sins. We ask you to bless this cup of the fruit of the vine and this unleavened bread. May we show forth the Lord's death suffering till he comes again. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask it all. Amen. Alas and did my Savior see, and did my sovereign die, would he devote that sacred hit? For such a one as I at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the Now we've come to another portion of what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. And that's this idea of giving. Again, we say thank you to 
all of you members of the University Church of Christ, on behalf of the elders and, and the deacons and myself, we appreciate so very much how much you continue to love the Lord, even though we're not coming together collectively in, in one place. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you the wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Pray with me as we give thanks for your offering, our offering. Gracious Father, you are the giver of every perfect gift. Our prayer is that as we give back to you, we will always remember that you are our source. Every other thing in our lives is just a resource. Guide, protect, and keep us, O oh Lord, in your loving care. As we give this offering, we give it because we first love you. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. As we get ready to close out this worship assembly on this day, our prayer is that you have been blessed. For all of you who are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're a Christian or not, Remember, God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for this day, for all who have been a part of this virtual worship. I humbly ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless and keep each and every one of us in your loving care. My desire has been to glorify you, to lift up Jesus, to encourage, strengthen, and build up the people of God, and then to speak a word that your Holy Spirit can use to convict the hearts of those who have yet to obey the gospel of Christ. My prayer is that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts have been acceptable unto you. Would you watch over us now as we separate from one another in this virtual assembly? May the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with each of us henceforth, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen.